That's from Monday, left over from the business policy thing. Okay. okay, time we're ready to start. So, a couple of a uh, couple of you know reminders in case you need it. I keep saying it just in case you forgot the last one that I gave you. The quiz is a week from today. The review session's already up there. I will set up office and office hour time on Sunday in case you have questions related to the quiz. So it'll be a Zoom session, obviously, because you'll be at home, I'll be at home. So one way or the other. So Wednesday, first 30 minutes of class covers, packet tip, which will be you know, through. There's a little bit left today that I'll do, but basically packet tip. So you, after today's class, you have a week up. So the material that I mostly do on Monday would not really be on the quiz, but through everything. So let's talk about valuing private companies. And if you remember, I started the discussion with this issue of with publicly traded companies, we make this assumption, perhaps cavalierly, that the marginal investor is diversified. You think, why? Why does it matter? What, what is it a bias when you assume a marginal investor is diversified? There's no it's not that there's no undiversified risk, but they don't care about it because in their portfolios, it goes away. So I can focus just on the risk you cannot diversify away, which is basically what beta measures. So the minute you use beta, so whether you like it or not, you're assuming marginal investors are diversified. And as a foundation, I said, if you have a private to private transaction, but a private seller and a private buyer, that's almost never going to be true. Why? Partly because of constraints, right? You start a business, where's every dollar of your money going? It's going into the business. Maybe later in your life when you get really wealthy, you can start splitting away. But even Bill Gates at the peak of his glory had almost 100% of his wealth tied up in Microsoft. Microsoft, the difference was it was a public company. So the marginal investment there could be some institutional investment, but it's a private business. You've got undiversified buyers and undiversified sellers. We're going to talk about what to do mechanically about it, but I want to get a sense of intuition. You have two companies. They look exactly the same, same business, same kinds of characteristics, but one is privately owned and the other is publicly traded. Which one would you expect to have the higher cost of equity and why? Lead me through the intuition behind which one will have the higher cost of equity and why. Alan, what do you think? Uh, the private will have a higher one. And give me the intuition. The diversified um, investor can diversify uh, on non-systematic risk, right? So that risk will be away from the cost of equity of probably great companies. We're not for private companies, but the investors are not. I've got to count all risks. So anytime people start listing up every risk in a company, the public company, I'm going to say, stop. I don't care that styles change. I don't care if that happens because I can diversify it away as an investor. I don't have that luxury when I have all my wealth tied up in the business. So today we're going to see that private company cost of equities are going to be significantly higher than public company. How much it depends on the business you're in, right? Some businesses, most of your risk might be, might be market related. In the banking business, for instance, 80% of the risk comes from macroeconomic and market factors. You run a private bank, your cost of equity is going to be high, but not as high as it would be for yours a private owner of a, a restaurant where you have all kinds of risk. I mean, imagine if I start to build in risk for location. So a restaurant is a big deal, right? You build a restaurant, whatever highway takes people away. With a publicly traded restaurant company, I don't do that because I assume it can get diversified away. With the private company, it's going to come. But to show you, even within private companies, it can be distinctions. Now, I was talking this morning in my corporate finance class about how I have this mission, or a mission is probably too strong a word. I have to talk to the Mets in about three weeks, about, to the Mets management. It's part of a you know, series of talks I'm giving in 0.72. You know what binds 0.72 and the Mets together? They're both owned by Steve Cohen. So, it's a, so 0.72 is in Hudson Yard, so the Mets management. And I've been, yesterday afternoon, I was working on a corporate finance presentation for the Mets. It's, it's a fascinating application of corporate finance principles. And I was trying to come up with a hurdle rate for the Mets. 
First, I'm going to do it in US dollar terms. That's the last thing I want to fight on is convert to a currency. So I'm going to start with the risk premium. That's going to be easy. What equity risk premium am I going to use? Equity risk is the price of risk. That's it. So the number I am stuck on is what do I use to come up with the cost of equity? Now, of course, you can say it's privately owned, but the person who owns it is Steve Cohn. Is that the only thing in his portfolio? No, he's worth about 15 to 20 billion. So Steve Cohen, in fact, is closer to a diversified investor than an undiversified investor. I'm going to say lots of nice things about the Yankees and not so nice things about the Mets, but in this one, I'm going to argue that the Mets have an advantage over the Yankees. Who owns the Yankees? The Steinbrenner family, right? How much of their wealth is in the Yankees? Pretty much all of it at this point. So if you think about decision-making, if you have only 10% of 15% of the wealth in a business like Steve Cohen is, you can afford to take kind of hit, hit, you know, hit for the fences, go for big things if he views the Mets as a business. I don't think he does. I think it's a very expensive toy, to be quite honest. And he doesn't run it like a business. He runs it as, hey, this is my passion. I'm a Mets fan all my life. I now have the money to own it. Would any, would any of you buy the, your favorite sports team if you had the money? Absolutely, right? Manchester United fan, wouldn't you love to be the owner of Manchester United? Not only can you go into every game, you're the star of the show. Everybody else kind of hangs out around you. There's a reason why with sports teams, it's all about pricing. I think I can't think of a single professional sports franchise where the people running it think of it as a business. They're being pushed up. I mean, take the NFL. The Pittsburgh Steelers are owned by the Rooney family. One of the old time owners who's run it as a business. They're the outliers. I mean, the Redskins are up for sale. You see the prices that people are offering for the Redskins? This is not a national franchise in the sense the Dallas Cowboys are. But I think the numbers being bandied around is six to seven billion. You know, collectively, how much EBITDA all of the MLB teams made last year? Put all together, all 30 teams. Less than 600 million. Half of them lose money. This is on an EBITDA basis. The, the team with the highest EBITDA, and I was shocked when I saw this among the MLB. I don't know if you're not baseball fans, it's completely going over your head. Anybody want to guess which team is the highest EBITDA? That's awesome. Oakland A's. The Seattle Mariners. The Oakland A's have a city problem. I mean, in a sense, the problem for Oakland, for the Oakland A's is they're in a media market where they've essentially lost the fight. It's because San Francisco Giants own that market. It might be the same media market. So it's not going to be the Oakland A's for very much longer. It could be the Las Vegas A's for all we know. But that's only a matter of time. But it's Seattle Mariners. The Yankees have the highest revenues of any mammal B team, but they lose money. Why? Because the player contracts are large, their expenses are large. The Mets lose even more money because they have the highest percentage of their revenues going to, I think in 2022, 83% of, 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 of all their revenues went into player contracts. We talk about, we think in terms of traditional businesses, that's like having a gross margin of four or five percent. There's not much room to. So the last section, I'm going to start with the three big drivers of value, revenue growth, profitability, and reinvestment. And every single one, if you think about MLB collectively, things don't look good. On revenues, the collective revenues of the MLB have been pretty flat and attendance is dropping. So it's a flat revenue business. I told you the EBITDA is collectively 600 million you know, companies are barely making money. The teams are barely making money. So it's low revenue growth, terrible margins, You know, exactly. If I valued MLB teams, I'm going to get abysmally low values. Okay. But they're going to be priced. And if you know that this is, you know why the it's always going to be a pricing game? As long as the number of professional sports teams is fewer than the number of billionaires, you have a scarcity problem, right? These are there's a, there's a category of assets that I call trophy assets. Art, the world of historic. The Financial Times, remember the, the, the quintessential British financial was bought by somebody for, and somebody said, well, 
Why would you pay that much for a newspaper that's because you're buying a trophy asset? You're buying something where you're not treating it as a business. You're buying it for the same reason you buy art which means to price these, you've got to find other trophy assets. This gets very closely to how you price things. So you price professional sports teams by looking at other profit. So the day the Redskins get sold for 7 billion, guess what happens to the Dallas Cowboys pricing? It's going to hit 10 billion. I'll make a prediction. Next year when Forbes does the rankings for the NFL, the Cowboys, which right now, who right now are the most valuable NFL franchise, are going to see the value jump by 30%. It's a sample size of one. One transaction is going to reprice everything. That's a very dangerous place to be in pricing. All you need is one crazy guy, right? He goes out and pays three times something to be where everything else gets pushed up. And this is, I think, the Achilles heel of pricing is everything gets scaled up or scaled down based on transactions. And you have relatively few transactions. You're going to see this play out. So after I do the mensing, I'll send you all the presentation if you're interested. The corporate finance presentation for professional sports teams. But stakeholders in a professional sports team, very different than stakeholders in a company. It's about how do you make debt decisions in the sports team. So that'll come soon. So let's talk about you know, the, the private company. And today we will come up with a way of adjusting a private company's cost of equity up for the fact that the potential buyer is undiversified. We'll also talk about, I talked about buyer's remorse, how you attach the discount up front. The traditional practice is to put a fixed discount, 20 to 25%. It's amazing how this rule of thumb has come into play. Now, private company valuation, I let, you know, Shannon Pratt is a legendary name. And Shannon, about 1980 or 81, wrote the first book. It's called Value Closely Held Businesses. And he laid out, and he did a great job of laying out, but he, along the way, also set up rules of thumb which over time got almost reinforced by studies that found that the rule of thumb worked. And the rule of thumb in liquidity is you value a private company and you knock off 20% or 25%. Why? Because private companies are illiquid. Today, I'm going to challenge that notion. First, that you automatically take in a liquidity discount and that it has to be the same for every private company. In fact, just to set up that discussion that's going to come, let's suppose that I came to you with four private businesses you're worried about illiquidity in all of them. I want you to tell about, tell me which of these companies you would attach the biggest illiquidity discount on and which one you might set for a lower discount. The first is a money-making cash flow generating company to a long-term buyer. You see why the buyer also matters, right? Because it's not just what the business is, but how much the buyer cares. The second is a profitable cash flow generating company to a cash constrained buyer. The third is an unprofitable negative cash flow company to a long term buyer. And the final one is an unprofitable negative cash flow company to a cash constrained buyer. Which of these are you going to have the largest dispute? What is it about? So I heard a C and a D. Let's take C and D, right? What, what, why is having cash flow? If you have a, two companies, one produces a lot of positive cash flows, others negative cash flows, why do you need liquidity less than the first company? What's liquidity? You need cash, right? If the company itself is throwing off cash. In a sense, it's already li partially liquid. So money losing companies should have bigger, you have bigger worries about liquidity than money making companies. And you have two potential buyers. One is a long-term buyer and presumably long-term buyers, you can live with cash flows being low and negative or, and you don't care about liquidating in the near term. And the other is a cash constrained buyer. A cash constrained buyer will always demand a larger discount because they worry more. What if things go wrong? Already you can see why this is going to create a nightmare in private company valuation, right? Because if I ask you what discount should I apply to my company, first you're going to look at the characteristics of my company. It's money making, money losing, cash flow rich or cash flow poor. And then you're going to ask me about the buyer, right? Because you cannot come up with a discount without knowing who the potential buyer is. If the potential buyer is a long-term buyer who doesn't really need the cash, you might you can try for a lower discount. You might not get it, but you should start with the premise. Yeah. Is this pricing or valuation? It is valuation, but in a sense, the value is different to different buyers. With public companies, that can't happen because the lower cost buyers get pushed out of the process. The market 
So it's demand and supply takes care of it. With private companies where you see card buyers, finding the right buyer can make a big difference in whether you get a billion dollars for your company or $600 million for your company. It, you know, I, I tell you know, people trying to sell their business is the biggest part of you getting good value is finding the right buyer. If you find the wrong buyer, you can finesse it, you can negotiate as much as you want, but you're negotiating from a position of weakness. So your discount is going to vary across companies. It's also going to vary across buyers. But it also vary across time. We give you two points in time. One is right after the 2008 crisis. The market is in meltdown. Everybody's scared. The other is five years later, things are looking good. The economy's humming along. The market's doing well. Which period is the discount going to be larger? During the crisis. I mean, now I'm saying your discount is going to be a function not just of the company you're trying to value, but the buyer you're looking at and the time you're around. You actually, so if you look around and bid ask spreads are rising in publicly traded markets, guess what? Your liquidity discount should also start to go up because you're in scary times and the liquidity discounts will be there. So today we're going to talk about the process of estimating discounts and may, perhaps making it more dynamic than the 20 to 25% that people take as a standard discount. So lots on our table, lots to do. Let's get uh, go back to where I left you on uh, Monday. I think we were on page Is it 134? Yeah. So here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to value a private business for a private to private transaction first. As I said, this is where every conceivable complexity that you can think of comes into play. So I'm going to keep it very simple. Okay? So you've been asked to assess or say the value of a restaurant that the restaurant owner is planning. The restaurant owner is right now the chef, pretty well-known chef, and he's planning to sell it to an investment banker. So how would an investment investment banker start of investment banking? He's always he's watched so many food shows on Food Network. He says running a restaurant sounds like so much more fun. So he decides to take all of this wealth, and this is going to be key to how you think about this. All of his wealth that he's earned by spending 20 hours a day for the last 10 years working in an investment bank, and he's going to buy this restaurant. So I'll set it up. The, rest, the restaurant is doing pretty well. In the most recent year, it reported 1.2 million in revenues and $400,000 in pre-tax operating profit, at least according to the restaurant financials. The firm has no conventional debt outstanding, but it has one lease debt outstanding where the, the restaurant is to pay 120,000 each year for the next 12 years. So let's start this process. Let's start by looking at the financials to make sure that the numbers that the chef is claiming the restaurant makes is actually the right. So as I look through the financials, so these were, these are, I could see that the restaurant is growing. That's good news. But the only problem is every seat is now being, it's doing well, but every seat, so capacity matters, right? You can't just keep adding chairs in the middle of the restaurant or in the kitchen to bring people in. It's operating at pretty close to full capacity. The operating lease expense is given, the wages are there, but the owner chef does not draw a salary. Why? Because he owns the restaurant. Why would he draw a salary? If whatever's left comes to him anyway. But this is going to be significant because you're going to be buying the restaurant. You've got to figure out what to do. You've got wages, material, other operating expenses. So basically, it looks like the financials are pretty reasonably done. Nothing is being held back. Hopefully, there's no fraud. But there are two things. One is he's the lease expense is treated as an operating expense. This wasn't just him. It was everybody was doing this at the time that I did this. All companies were doing this. The second is that he hasn't charged himself a salary. If I value the restaurant with the 240000 as my income, and I pay for the restaurant, you know the problem I'm gonna run into, right? The day after I buy the restaurant, I'm gonna walk in and I'm gonna notice that there's no food. What happened, chef? Because the owner is gone. I can't cook. If I could try to cook as the investment banker, but my guess is then the full capacity will go to zero capacity very quickly because <laughs> how many peanut butter and jellies can you deliver before people say, you know what, that's a very singular menu item, but it's not the only item I came to buy. 
So clearly I've got to correct for that as well. So we'll talk about that correction that kicks in, but you have to leave. So let's start with the discount rate part because it's a more manageable part. You know, it's the part that, that, that I worried about the most because of this diversified non diversified so conventional risk and return models, of course, you assume investors are diversified with private businesses. If the buyer, with the buyer who's not diversified, this is going to break down. And we already talked about which direction. So if I were to set this up, basically a traditional beta is going to look at only the market risk. I've got to figure out a way to bring in the rest of the risk into the calculation. If you remember the regression betas we did, you know, when you look at regression beta pains for a publicly traded company, you'll see a beta. That's a raw beta with regression beta. So think of looking at a Bloomberg beta page. You've got the raw beta. But on that Bloomberg beta page, there's also an R squared reported for each company. Remind me again what that R squared tells me in a, in a typical beta regression. Chandan? How much beta? How much? But finish it. How much what expects? How much of the? Beta. But in this case, what's the data that I'm trying to explain? Um, how much of the variation in stock returns is explained by the market? In other words, the R squared is a, is a measure of the proportion of the variance in this company that is explained by the market. So it's one minus the R squared. <laughs> it's a portion of the variance that's not explained by the market. So if I can get this for every restaurant company, then you could argue, well, maybe I can find how much of the risk. So here's what I started with. I started by looking at regression betas for restaurants, and I very quickly decided it wasn't the right sample. Why? Because this was an upper end, uh, an upscale restaurant, was drawing people. With... So I actually switched gears, and I went with the beta for high-end retailers, saying the type of people who come to either a high-end restaurant are not the type of people who are going to McDonald's. That's not... It, it basically, um, you know, it's it's a flexibility we, we seldom use because we're so caught up in industry groupings that we sometimes don't step back and say, hey, what's the right group of companies that I should be using for the beta? So the the, the, uh, the unlevered beta for those high-end retailers was 1.18. So I'm starting for you, it's 1.18. But here's where the fact that the buyer is not diversified is going to throw me off. If I use that 1.18 beta, I'm focusing only on the market risk in the company, right? So think of this as an algebra problem. If I can solve, somehow tell you how much risk is not market risk, this private, the private buyer is going to be exposed to all of those units as well. So I'm going to take the market beta and scale it up, reflect the rest of the risk. With what? That's where the correlation comes in. So basically, if you look at the R squared, it was 25% across these companies. 25% of the variance in a typical restaurant is explained by the market. Here's a little statistical twist here. Beta is a standard deviation. Anybody remember the beta, the equation for a beta? It's, it's correlation between the stock and the market times the standard deviation of the stock and the numerator divided by the sigma of the market. So it's a standard deviation. You think so what? I'm going to take the square root of the R squared, which of course gives me the correlation coefficient. The reason I use the correlation coefficient, beta is a standard deviation measure, so I'm going to stay with the standard deviation analog. The, the square root of 0.25 is 0.5. 1.18 divided by 0.5 gives me a total beta. I'm going to call this a total beta specifically because I'm capturing total risk rather than this market risk. It's always going to be higher than your market beta. How much? It depends on the correlation of the business you're in with the market. The lower the correlation, the bigger the total beta is going to be relative to the market beta because I'm bringing in the rest of the risk calculation. Somebody back there had a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so like defining the market clearly, the market is all restaurants, but it's overall and it's the market. Like what's your variable, it's all, I mean, independent variable is always each restaurant, each publicly traded restaurant. So, you know, you, I'm not running a regression of restaurants collectively. I'm running a regress, regression of each publicly traded. So if I take Chipotle, I take the returns in Chipotle, I run it against the S&P 500, I get a beta and R squared. So I do this for each company. So it's exactly like the bottom-up beta process, but now I've brought in the R squared as well. So what you see are the averages across publicly traded restaurants. So my total beta is 
That 2.36 is my unlevered bail, unlevered total bail. With publicly traded companies, after you got an unlevered beta, you levered up the beta, right? And to lever up the beta, what do you need? A market value of debt and a market value of equity. And here's the second problem we run into with private companies. We don't have market values. I know you're tempted to say, let me go with book values there and there. Don't, I mean, that's not even on my choice list. It's not going to work. So I would estimate the market value debt to equity. You can try something that's never worked for me. You can call the owner of a private business and say, what's your target debt to equity ratio? You'll have no idea what you're talking about. So hang up the phone very quickly because it'll open you up to two choices you have in terms of a debt to equity ratio you can use for a private company. One is you can look at publicly traded companies, look at their debt to equity ratios. In this case, that would be been about 14.33% for publicly traded restaurants and say, if a publicly traded restaurant has a debt ratio, that must come from the kind of business they're in. And every private business in that space will have the same debt to equity. It's unsatisfying, but it's quick, right? You take the industry average debt to equity, you plug it in, you come up with a levered pay. Is there another way you could do this? So I cannot use book value. I can use industry averages, but then I'm assuming that private companies and public companies in that space have the same debt to equity. So that'll give me a cost of debt, though. It won't give me a, a way of getting the debt, the equity value, right? The, the, big, the big missing variable is the equity value. The debt, I can live with the book debt, which we do with public companies. Do you have an estimated value of equity you get out of this process? Yeah, you do a DCF, you value the firm, you subtract out it, you get a value of equity, right? Could I use that estimated value to get debt to equity? I could, but there's a little bit of a catch. What's the problem I'm going to run into? Circularity. I'm going to have circularity, right? Check the iteration box in Excel. It's magical. Try it out. And use your estimated value of equity as the equity in a debt-to-equity ratio. What it'll create is a debt-to-equity ratio that's consistent with your estimated value of equity for the company, but the iteration box has to be on. Because if it's not, you're going to get arrows all over your spreadsheet. You're going to blow up on it. But it's actually a choice with private companies. Do you know why I don't you do this with public companies? Why do we use market value again for public companies? It's not because the market is right, but because that's what it would cost me to go buy the company. So market value of equity in public companies is because it's a trend. Here, I'm saying there's no transaction yet. I'm going to be the guy who comes up with the transaction number, and you're using your estimated value of equity then to come up with the debt to equity ratio. Now, while the lease debt is treated, lease expense is treated as an operating expense, I'm going to do what I've always done, which is capitalize leases and come up with a synthetic rating. The synthetic rating I came up with was 3.33, which gave me an interest coverage ratio rating. So basically, you know what Ed suggested, I'm basically using. So the cost of debt is the easier part, right? Because you can use a synthetic rating for any company, including a private company. The rating is just an intermediate stop. It's to come up with a default spread. My free tax cost of debt is 7.5%. My after tax cost of debt, at least time that it did, is 4.5%. So I have a levered total beta. I have a pre tax cost of debt. My cost of capital using that levered total beta and the cost of debt is 13.25%. It's higher than it would be for a public company because I'm using the total beta rather than the market beta. So that was my first stop is getting a discount rate. So it's really a variation of what I do with public companies with one small twist, right? But the only twist was I took the market beta and I scaled it up. And the other minor twist was the debt to equity ratio. I had to make this judgment on do I go with an industry average or my own estimated values. Second stop, I redid the financial. Redid in what sense? I put in a cost for the share, 150000 And obviously I've got to go do my homework. How much will it cost me to get a well-regarded chef at the restaurant, put that in as an expense that lowers my income. But capitalizing leases has, the, has an effect of pushing up my operating income. My operating income after the correction is, instead of being you know, four, 400 million, is 370. Lower operating income because of the addition of the salary and the conversion of leases to that. Any questions on the cleaning up here?
Now, to the extent that those financials to begin with were solid, my work was relatively simple, right? One of my, one of the classic problems in private company valuation, especially in Asia and Latin America, is you go and ask the owner to show you their financial. They will give you the financials and you'll take one look at this country, right? You're losing money every single year. Mm -hmm. Why? These are my official financials for the tax guy. And then you'll have to go into a back room, lock the door, make sure that nobody can see you. And the second set of financials come out, which are the unofficial financials, which reflect what the company actually made. So those are things you have to deal with private companies that presumably you don't have to worry as much with public companies. So I've got the discount rate. I've got the, the, the financials near done. I have to factor in that the chef who was owning the restaurant till yesterday is now leaving. I'm hiring a new chef. But the, the customers who came to the restaurant came because of the old chef. So I have to figure out how much of my revenues I'm going to lose. In this case, I've made an assumption of 20%, but how do you come up with this percentage that you're going to lose to the new keepers? You probably have to have somebody stand outside the restaurant and do some kind of a survey or get some sense of how many of you would be back tomorrow if I told you there's a different chef in the, in the kitchen. Some people might come for the atmosphere. They say, I don't care who the chef is. But there's no easy way to get this without having a gauge of how much loyalty customers have to the particular chef or owner and how many of those customers will leave when, the, when, when, when that chef leaves. Finally, I mean, I can't, just because I'm building a private company, forget about my fundamentals. Remember, to grow, I have to reinvest money. In this case, the return on capital that I estimate was about 20% based on their book values, which, for which I can, I can do this with a private as opposed to a public company. I put in a stable growth rate. Why stable growth rate? Remember, I said they're already at 100% capacity, 2% growth rate in perpetuity. And if my return on capital and growth rate are right, in a steady state model, they will have to reinvest 10%. You're saying, where's the reinvestment going? You've got to probably upgrade the restaurant. So even though it's lease space, physically, you've got to keep the restaurant looking good. That 10% reflects the reinvestment you're making in capital investments you've got to make to keep this restaurant going. So I think I'm ready to value the restaurant. I take the adjusted habit. I come up with the cost of capital adjusted for the fact that you've got to keep us in discount. I come up with the cost of capital and reinvestment rate. So I've got my free cash for the firms. There's my operating income grown out one year, one minus the tax rate, one minus the reinvestment rate. So that's free cash for the firm written as one item. Divide by cost of capital minus growth, the value that I get for the restaurant overall is 1.449 then. Saying, is that the value that I should pay? Well, not quite yet, right? Because you have the lease debt to subtract. How to subtract out the lease debt? The value that you get for the restaurant is 521,000. Sounds astonishingly low, right? Because the operating income is what, 300,000? It looks like I'm paying only two times operating income. But by the time you take out the tax effect, the reinvestment effect, it works at about five times income <laughs> after tax earnings in the most recent year. And it's low because the buyer is not diversified, demanding a 13.25% discount. But there's one more final step to do, right? That's the value that I get for the restaurant after adjusting for the fact that the buyer is not diverse. But there's an illiquidity issue that still has not been dealt with. The question is, how big a discount do I need to attach to this 521,000? And as I said, that discount can't be one number for every company. It can't be a single rule of thumb. It can't be 20% for every company. And as you saw in the pre-class -te pre test, it should vary across companies. It should vary across time, and it should vary across time. So at least I'll give you a template on how to think about a little bit this kind. It might not give you a precise answer. But that template comes from first looking at how this rule of thumb came to be. So Shannon wrote, I think, his book in 1981. He set up a firm called William at Oregon. They started creating research to back up. Because remember, many of these things end up in court. You do a private company appraisal, it gets, you know, for the tax guy, for the divorce court, it ends up in court. So they wanted to create an infrastructure that backed up these discounts. You could go to court and say, look, there's a study that backs it up. And if you look at private company discounts, the studies that back up the discounts come from two sets of studies. One are studies of what are called restricted stock. 
not restricted sources. It's actually publicly traded companies that issue shares to the market with restrictions on those shares on trade. So the restriction will be, I think originally it used to be two years, you could not trade after you got the shares. The nice thing about restricted stock is you can actually observe the discount, right? The problem with the liquidity discounts is usually they're unobservable. If you looked at private company, what people pay for private companies, so how much of that would be liquidity discount? Nobody knows, right? You see the price that was paid. But with the restricted stock, you can observe the discount. Why? Because these are publicly traded companies. You can see their stock price. You can see the price people paid for the restricted stock. And because the price is low, you can say how much lower than the market price they pay because they could not trade for the next two years. So I'm going to show you some of the evidence that comes from restricted stock studies and why you shouldn't trust them. You, know, it's, it, 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 you build a whole infrastructure discount. The second is looking at what happens pre-IPO. Remember, you have a private company, it's going to go public in three months. In those three months, often you have transactions between owners, VCs and founders selling it. And if you can observe the price on what they pay and you look compared to the IPO price, at least in theory, you can argue that discount was because they could not wait two and a half months. Lots of flaws in the logic, but maybe that's a little bit. So both cases, I'm going to argue that you've got a sampling bias. And we'll talk about what that sampling bias is. And that sampling bias will show up. But in both cases, what you're doing is you're comparing the discounted price you're getting on the restricted shares and the pre-IPO transaction, the market price, and estimating the discount. So let's talk about the restricted stock study. They started in the late 70s, and over time, they all consistently showed discounts of 25, 30, 35%. It's great for appraisals. You know why? Because most appraisal is for tax reasons and you want a low number. It served private company appraisers well to have these studies back them up when they say we have a 25% discount or 30, and here's a restricted stock study on that. Most of these studies just compute a median discount. So they'll have dozens and dozens of restricted stock transactions, they'll take a median discount. In about, about 25 years ago, uh, actually 35 years ago now, Bill Silver used to teach, he used to teach the foundations class. I think he did this almost as a summer paper. Decided to take those restricted stock transactions. They say, rather than compute the median, I want to see why the discounts vary across different restricted stock offerings. And he ran a regression. And I'll talk about why I'm even showing you the regression, where he took the log of the price to the, the discount, the restricted stock price to the actual market price. So think of that as one minus the discount on the left hand side against the level of revenues, arguing that higher revenue companies should have smaller discounts against um, what how big the restricted stock offering was. Larger block offerings should have bigger discounts. Whether the company was making money, it's a dummy variable. Earnings making money or not making money. The companies making money should have smaller discounts. And if the person buying the restricted stock was a customer, he argued that because of that, you might end up with a smaller discount because the customer gets other benefits. They ran it across restricted stock studies. They're all statistically significant. His objective was to show, look, there's a median discount, but it varies across. He's left it at that. I'm going to take Bill's regression and use it to come up with a way of varying discounts across companies. And here's what I did. If you look at that regression, he has coefficients on whether the company is making money or losing money, right? He also has coefficients on how big the revenue is. So I took a, a company and let the revenues change and also made the company go from money making to money losing. And using the same regression, here's what the discounts look like depending on the level of revenues and whether the company is money making or money losing. So let's say you're a company with 25 million in revenue. That's a money making company. Based on the regression, the discount should be about 24%. But if that same company is losing money, the discount should be 32%. If you compare that to a billion dollar company, billion dollar company that's making money, the discount should be 18%. So essentially I'm taking the regression and coming up with the way of saying, if you came in with the business and say, how much should my discount be? I'm gonna ask you two questions. One is how much were your revenues last year? And did you make money? And if you can give me the revenues and whether you made or lost money, I can go in and say, based on those characteristics, this is what your discount should be. A very simplistic extension of what the original regression did to be able to differentiate across companies. So 
So let's talk. I don't even know what that slide was doing. Anymore. So let's talk about why. Yeah, go ahead. But is that like, yes, is this would be respecting the industry, like the sector that they are in? It shouldn't matter, right? Restrictions are restrictions. Why? Why would you care less about a discount in one industry than another? Give me the intuition, because then I can start to bring it in. What is it about? I mean, say like the grocery stores. So you're saying safer businesses should have smaller discounts than riskier business. I agree, right? If you were rerunning syllabus regression, what would you do? How would you bring that in? You can't throw it in industry specific because there are not enough observations, right? These are small samples. So I can't just say, I'm going to do just grocery store restricted stock. That's not a choice. But I can bring into the regression another variable, right? And that variable might measure variability of earnings in a sector. And the argument would be high variance earnings should lead to bigger discounts and low variance earnings. So if you're going to go the restricted stock route, that's what you would do is add variables. But I'm going to point to a fundamental problem with restricted stock studies that I think you can't make go away, no matter how much you slice in that today. What did I say about restricted stock? When you place it, you essentially, those people can't trade the stock, right? And you're settling for what? 30% discount, 25% discount, 20% discount. That's a lot of money to leave on the table, right? So when you think about the kinds of companies that issue restricted stock, no healthy company is ever going to issue restricted stock. It's just too much left on the table. So almost by exclusion, the kinds of companies that issue restricted stock tend to be money losing companies, distressed companies, companies that are have all kinds of risks. What you have is a sampling bias that's giving you too big a discount. It took the IRS 20 years to come up with this kind of problem. For, for, from the mid 80s all the way through 2002 or 2003, you know, appraisers went in front of courts and said, look, the restricted stock studies say discount of 30 to 35%. They got away with it because there was no pushback. So finally the IRS hired somebody who knew enough statistics that they could take the restricted stock studies and figure out how much of that discount came from the fact that these were troubled companies, distressed companies, small companies. And statistically, there's a way to break it up. And he concluded that about 25 to 35% discount came from the sampling bias. You take that out, your discount all of a sudden goes from 35 to 10%. It's a moment of awakening for a lot of private company appraisers because for the first time when they went to court and said, we applied a 35% discount because the restricted stock study said it was okay, you had a counter of somebody saying, but most of that has nothing to do with the liquidity. How can you take the 35% discount and apply it in a healthy private company that shares none of the characteristics of the company that issued restricted stock? So when you look at restricted stock studies, they look like the discount is large, but after you correct for that sampling bias, the discounts become much smaller. So let me give you an alternative restricted stock study. The IPO studies are even worse. I don't believe it's a single word that comes out of the IPO studies because they find discounts of 50%. Let me ask you a question. You're a venture capitalist in a firm that's planning to go public in three months. You expect the price to be $1,000 per share. Would you accept $500 per share? I wouldn't. So what does that tell me? There's something wrong with these studies. Either they're making up the numbers or they're missing something critical. And what I think they're missing is every company that plan to go public, is it all, all companies that plan to go public actually go public. The problem is they're missing, the sampling bias comes to the fact that they're missing the companies where you have these sales, but the IPO falls apart, right? So you, you're counting only IPO companies and working backwards. And by doing that, you're creating sampling bias that's killing your results. So if you don't trust restricted stock studies, you don't trust IPOs, you saying, what the heck should I do? In China, actually, it's a very interesting test because you have the same stock listed in Shenzhen Exchange and the Hong Kong Exchange. They trade at different prices. And part of that is an illiquidity issue. So the Hong Kong Exchange is more liquid. You know, you'd expect the price in the Shenzhen Exchange is higher because of restrictions in Chinese investors. So clean test of liquidity is really difficult. So here's what I'm going to do. Remember I said there's a cost of buyer's remorse even when you buy publicly traded shares. What's that cost? It's a bid-ask spread. 
The bid ask spread is the illiquidity discount for a publicly traded company. We're saying, but it's so small. You're right. If you take a company like Apple or Microsoft, the bid ask spread is less than 0.2% of the market price. But if you go to a lightly traded stock on the NASDAQ, let's say it's trading at $2, don't be surprised to see a bid ask spread of 50 cents on that stock. 50 cents divided by $2 is a 25% illiquidity discount. So even among publicly traded companies, there's an illiquidity discount. It's called the bid ask spread. I think of how much bigger your sample size has got, right? You can take every publicly traded stock. You can compute the spread as a percentage of the price for every stock. You've got an illiquidity discount for every stock. And now your sample size, because it's thousands of stock, you can run the regression against level of rep, some things that you can observe for a private company as well. So about 15 years ago, I decided to run this regression. The fact that I've not revisited tells you how much of a pain it was to do. I don't value private companies, so I don't particularly care what the liquidity discount is. But if I cared, I would rerun this regression every year. So I took the bid as spread divided by the stock price for every publicly traded company that became the left-hand side of the equation. On the right-hand side, I threw in three variables. Level of revenues, like Bill Silver did for the restricted stock, I threw it in there hypothesizing that higher revenue companies should have smaller bid aspects as a person of value. Second, I threw in cash as a person of firm value, arguing that companies with a lot of cash should have smaller bid aspect because they're less risky in, in a sense. No, cash is liquid. And finally, I threw in the monthly trading volume, arguing that more liquid stocks should have lower spreads. Now I'm running it across the region. The R squared is not bad. I came, I, no, I don't remember what the actual number was, 30, maybe 30 to 40%. And I could have kept adding variables, but the variables I add should be variables I can get for a private business. You're saying, so if I took uh, the restaurant that I just gave you and plugged in the revenues for the restaurant, 1.2 million, the fact that it's a money-making company, the cash was 5% of value and never trades, so put in a zero trading volume, I get a predicted bid ask spread for the company of 12.88%. Given how the market bid ask spread vary across public companies, treating this private business like a public company gives me a spread of 12.88%. I now have a weapon I can use for every private company as long as they could squeeze it through this bid ask spread regression. So if you look at the variation here, I, if I use the traditional just 25% for every company, let's call it the bludgeon approach, you can take this silver regression and refine it for the level of revenues and it's a money-making company, I get a 28.75% discount. But the bid ask spread approach gives me a discount that's far lower. And I think the 12.88% is a more viable, reasonable discount because it doesn't have that sampling bias that permeates the first two approaches. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the 521,000 and estimated the value of equity to be and knock off 12.88% of that value to come up with the value of equity for this company. So it's going to end up at like 440,000 by the time I'm all done. Yes. Did you add the, the, the fact that the buyer is an option in that sort of work? That's going to be tougher, right? Because I don't observe buyers in the, pu in the public market. When I use the bid aspirate regression, I, I don't observe the buyer, right? All I observe is the trade happening and the spread. But in the private space, perhaps one way to get a measure of the illiquidity discount is take private company transactions and separate them into private company transactions with cash constrained buyers. You have to define it. And private company transactions with buyers who don't care as much long term buyers. And the hypothesis is true the discount should be low for the long term buyer group. And maybe you can start quantifying. The problem, as I said, is people have become so used to applying this rule of thumb that nobody wants to do the dirty work of actually building up to an illiquidity discount from scratch. Nobody's too strong, but, but very few people want to deal with it. They prefer to keep this 20 to 25% and just move on. And I think we need to go back and look at illiquidity more carefully and how to bring it up. Now, I also believe that in private company valuation, a lot of people do double count illiquidity. The way they do it, is many private companies, the way they build up to a discount rate is not with the total beta, but with what's called the build-up approach. I call it the make-it-up approach, because here's how it goes. You start with the risk-free rate, you multiply beta by times the equity risk premium. So you'd start with the public company, right? In the build-up approach, you start adding things. You add a small cap premium, 4%. A company-specific risk premium is completely made up, 7%. 
And then look, so basically they keep adding things so they get to a number that they're comfortable with or 22%, that sounds about right. To which my response is, if that's where you wanted to end up, why did you go through this charade of acting like you got there by adding up numbers based on data because 22% was the number you wanted to reach. The problem is if you do decide to use a small cap room, which I don't think you should, and small cap companies earn higher returns because they're less liquid, pushing up the discount rate is gonna push down the value. You knock another 25% of that value for liquidity, didn't you punish the company twice once we're pushing up the discount rate? So I think if you're going to deal with the liquidity, it's gotta be transparent, it's gotta be in one place. Here I'm dealing with as a discounted value. If you prefer to build it as a higher discount rate, bring it in, but have to come up with ways of adjusting the discount rate then for illiquid companies. So that's private to private. You could see the, the diversification effect that pushed up your cost of equity. There's an illiquidity discount. Every conceivable nightmare in valuation came into play. Yes. Talk about why being totally undiversified and then able to be fully diversified. How do you deal with it? Okay, Control. that's actually a very good question. What if the buyer were a private equity investor who's sector focused? So, you know, they're diversified, but they diversified across 25 you know, manufacturing companies or steel companies or software companies. First, if you create a portfolio of 25 software companies, what I computed as a, as a correlation was an in, one was individual software companies. If I create a portfolio of 25 software companies, will the correlation of the market go up or go down? It's going to go up. It's not going to go to one because you're not fully diversified. So if your potential buyer is partially diversified, their sector focus, what you'll observe is you'll have to compute a correlation for an index. So for instance, software company index ETF with, uh, with the market, that correlation will be higher than an individual software company. And you replace your correlation with, uh, that you originally used with a higher correlation. What if your potential investor is a VC who's diversified across different businesses? Then your correlation is going to start drifting towards one. These are the consequences, right? It's going to push down your cost of equity. It's going to push up what you're willing to pay. It's what KKR and Blackstone have done to the private equity businesses by becoming these more diversified investors who are themselves publicly traded, they've removed the need to charge for company specific risk. And they're competing against more traditional sector focus. They're gonna beat them out. If they go head to head, they're gonna win almost every single time with the same set of cash flows because they can afford to pay a higher price, not because they're overpaying, but because they feel less of the risk. So I think even in the VC business, change is coming because the old VCs tend to be very, very sector focused, stay within a subset of software, a subset of, I think that's starting to change. It's starting to affect how much people are willing to demand or willing to accept as a cost of value. So let's move to a second scenario. It's private to public trade. Life becomes so much easier. Your potential buyer is a publicly traded company. What's the risk you should be building into your cost of equity? Whose money are they investing? Their investors' money, right? They're publicly traded. Their investors are diversified. I can go back to a market beta, this total beta. So it's not, we don't put in a total beta because the company is private, but because the buyer was not diversified. Here, you've taken it to the limit. The buyer is, is potentially fully diversified. I'm going to go to a market beta. A public company buys my business. How much of an illiquidity discount should I attach? What do I care about illiquidity? I can trade the shares of the public company. The need for illiquidity went away. In other words, if I replace my private numbers with buyers public, I can go back to a market beta. I can remove the illiquidity discount and I'm going to get a much lower cost of capital and a much higher value for the same business. Yeah. Um, maybe I don't understand, but if you're a public company that buys the private company and you want to get rid of it, won't you still be subject to the same buyers by assets or no, the liquidity is to your investors, right? It's not to you as a company. Right. But your investors can sell their shares anytime they want. So with public companies, that's why we, otherwise buying public companies is going to be a nightmare, right? Because you can think of every public company as a collection of illiquid assets. Take Tesla. I mean, you have a bunch of illiquid assets, those factories, the, the so 
If I decide to start attaching liquidity discounts to what public companies own, because if they sold that asset, they might have set up a discount, I'm going to open up an entire can of worms. So it's because their investors can buy and sell the shares that they stop having to put in a penalty for illiquidity. But if I remove the total beta effect and I remove the illiquidity discount, the value goes from 453,000 to 1.5 million. This is why a strategic buyer is in case of a diversified buyer. Let's not bring in the word strategic, that scares me, but a diversified buyer will be willing to pay a higher price. And in fact, the negotiating process, right? You're the seller, you know that I'm diversified. But I know that your alternatives are not diversified. So you know what the, what the negotiation is going to come down to. So you're going to have two numbers in your pocket as the seller. You're going to have the 453,000, which is what you'd get from another potential undiversified buyer. You have the 1.5 million that you would get. You're going to start your bidding at one point. You're saying, look, you know, you're not diversified. You, I mean, you're diversified. You don't care about liquidity. How about one? You know what I'm going to counter with? I'm going to counter with, no, 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 no. You're illiquid. You're, you know, and I care. So I'm going to counter with 454,000. And if I am the only diversified buyer in the game, the ultimate transaction price is going to be closer to the 453,000 than the one. You know, the one, I remember when we talked about, we talked about acquisition, the one area of acquisitions where there's potential value creation, it's very difficult to create value from acquisitions. The one area where there's value, value creation from acquisitions is publicly traded companies that are created by roll-ups of private businesses. Right? Browning Ferris went around the country buying up garbage disposal companies. Blockbuster in its days of glory went around buying video rental stores across the country. You're saying, how do they create value? Because they offer the owners of these businesses a higher number than they can get from any private transaction, but a much lower number than what they can afford to pay. You get to keep the difference as long as you only the second player enters the game, all bets are off, right? Because then the bidding wars are going to start. But you can see that there are two values for the same business, depending on who's looking at it. And as a potential seller, you'd like the public buyer value. And you're going to try to negotiate towards it, but you might not get it. And, and the converse is really just if the buy a, a division of a public asset, they yeah. uh, generate the price. It depends on what the end game is. Most private equity views itself as a transitory phase. You buy an asset not because you want to keep it as a private business, but because you want to flip it back to the public as a public business. So if private equity funds were actually buying companies to keep them private, it would be very difficult for them to justify the prices they're paying because they'd be offering well below the market price. But because they view this as I mean, the definition of success in private equity is you hold it for two or three years, then you exit by either selling to a public company or by taking it public yourself. So the effect of the lack of diversification tends to be smaller and becomes even smaller if the private equity players like a KKR or a Blackstone says, look, I'm diversified anyway. Yes? Why would block be considered diversified investment to the the company doesn't have to be the diversified investor, right? What's the test for diversification? I'm going to look at the top 17 shareholders in Blockbuster, and if they're pink, guess who they were, right? The dirty State Street. BlackRock was not around then. Companies don't have to be diversified. The investors in companies have to be diversified. That's why the public company becomes so easy to meet the diversification test, right? If I require companies to be diversified, there are very few companies in the world that could meet that test. But I don't need to. All I need is you be in the market and investors in your company to be diversified. So if you think about the prices, you've got two extreme values, 453,000, 1.48 million. Where you will end up will be entirely a function of what the relative numbers are on each side. If there are lots of potential public buyers for your business. You're going to end up closer to the 1.48 million. Conversely, if there's only one public buyer, a lot of private buyers, you're going to end up close to the 453,000. And somebody's going to claim the difference. The question is, is it the seller or the buyer? And depending on the sector, depending on the company, one side or the other could potentially walk away as the way. So in many ways, I mean, I don't you know, I, the part of India that I grew up in, 
retail. I think this is probably true of much of India, these small stores where you go buy stuff, tiny little. And the last time I was in my hometown, it's been a long time, I was walking around, it looked the same. And I was talking to the shop owners. And it turns out that private equity investors have actually been very active in that shop owner, these small shop owners, where they actually go in and buy 50% of the shop and they offer them what looks like a bargain price or a high price to the shop owner because they'd sold it to another shop owner that have got a lower number. But effectively it's private equity investors coming in and arbitraging the space between being a private business with all these penalties and a public company where you're removing the diversification discount. So that's why if you look at where private equity is most active, it's most active now in markets where that space is big. A lot of Asia, Latin America, even Europe. There are a lot of businesses that are still dominated by public or privately owned businesses rather than publicly traded companies. And those are the spaces where there's a chance to exploit different perceptions of risk in the same company. So private to private, private to public. Let's talk about what's different if a private company plans to go for an initial public offer. So you're doing the valuation because you want to take the uh, There are a couple of issues you want to deal with here. One is that when you make a public offering, there is a process you've got to go through. There are now challenges to the process, but the traditional process is you went and hired an investment banker. The investment banker valued your company. Let's back that up. It's really not value, priced your company. And then they guarantee an offering price. Sounds too good to be true, right? They guarantee they will deliver that price. And then there's an offering day and the market opens up. And down. So this is the process that for a century in the US has governed how companies go forward. That process is embedded in a couple of issues that you have to come up with. So let me take an example. This is actually from Twitter's IPO. So I usually value companies when they file their prospectus. So in an IPO in the US, you file a prospectus about six, eight, 10 weeks before you go public. And I do the valuation almost instantaneously after the prospectus is filed because I have no idea what the price would be. Because if you wait, then prices start to, there'll be rumors that the bank is offering this and it starts to permeate there. So the value that I came up with for Twitter on, uh, on, on the day of its prospect was $17.36. If you look at this valuation, it looks very similar to a typical public company valuation, right? You put your free cloud plug, you use a market beta. So it looks very similar to a public company valuation, but there are a couple of things in this valuation that make it a little bit. The first is on the offering day, Shares of the company are offered to the public and cash comes into the company, right? It's cash rates. I mean, you have to figure out first what percent the shares will be offered to, but cash. You have to tell me what you plan to do with that cash for me to complete this valuation. You see, what do you mean, what, what you can do? What are, the, what are the different things that a company can do with the cash it raises on an IP? Sir? One is it can allow existing owners to cash out. So it's really not dividends because you're not quite public, but you can say, okay, if you want to cash out. When Spotify went public, the entire proceeds were cashed out by existing owners. So that's one choice you can cash out. What else can you do? One is you can hold it as cash because you don't want to reinvest in any So the day after the IPO, the cash balance for a company is going to balloon out by the amount that came. The third is if you have taken on venture debt or any debt with high interest rates, you can pay it down. So you have to tell me what you plan to do with the cash because without doing it, I can't complete the valuation. If you plan to keep it on your balance sheet as a cash balance, I'm gonna increase the cash balance by whatever the proceeds are. On the day Alibaba went public, I had $16 billion to the cash balance. It went from the value went from 145 billion to 161 billion because 16 billion is what they raised from the offering day and they were planning to hold it in the company. So over it's almost overnight the company becomes more valuable. It's just a cash company. If Alibaba had planned to use the cash to pay down debt, that 16 billion would not show up in the cash balance, show up as a lower debt ratio and presumably a different cost of capital. As the 16 billion were cashed out by existing owners, I'm going to act like it never existed in, in any way because this goes out of the company. Yes. So this information is available in the, the prospectus. Usually keep, if you read the prospectus and pick up any prospectus, there will be 
a section where they tell you what they plan, what the, they plan to do with the proceeds. It's a requirement in every prospectus, and you can see what that is before you manage your capital. What about reinvestment in, in capex? And that is the cash is in waiting, right? The reason they went public is the, so Alibaba eventually invested this, but the day after the IPO, you're not, you don't know where they'll invest. So this actually becomes a way of covering their negative free cash flow equity if they had it for the next three or four years. So this actually offsets that negative effect by saying, I've raised the money already for the next three or four years. And if the company was brought in value in its decisions, you buy the cash difference. I'll tell you where it shows up. Remember the failure rate I attached? If I value this company before the IPO with those negative cash flows in the next five years, I'd probably attach a high failure rate because I'm saying, well, you have to go raise the capital. What if it doesn't happen? Let's say this company does an IPO and it's rich enough that they can raise the cash to cover the next five years of cash flow. Still the same cash flows. It puts the cash balance. But my failure rate, which I'm going to be in 25%, the day before the IPO can drop 5 or 10% because they now have the cash to survive those tough years. So I think that's the best place to show it. Discounts on cash, you probably don't want to do it at the IPO stage because you haven't given the management a chance to show that they're, and they're young companies, you really don't have a sense of how good they are as custodians of their cash. So let's talk about the issues in an IPO valuation that make a difference. First is, what do you plan to do with the process? As I said, you've got to tell me what that is. Second. By the time a company goes public, it's done all kinds of special deals. Remember, each VC round comes with its own financing where you promise the VC all kinds of neat things. Sometimes it takes a form of special type of common stock, you know, sometimes warrants or options. Your job is to clean up, to make sure that when you take the company public, you're counting all of that stuff. So that, those are the valuation issues. Talk about the pricing issues. What did the investment banker guarantee you? A price, right? So let's say you as an investment banker price a company at $20. Would you guarantee the $20 as your offering price? No, you want to discount. It's human nature. And investment bankers are actually open about the fact that they discount. If you read the, 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 the manual that investment bankers who go into IPOs are given, they said, come up with a value for the company or pricing for the company and take off 15%. Where did the 15% come from? I have no idea. It's become built into the process, take a discount. So we're going to have to deal with that when you look at the pricing of the company, but in the valuation, it's kind of a side issue. So let's talk about the proceeds. It can be taken out of the firm as was in Spotify, used to pay down debt, which you sometimes see at companies that have accumulated, especially a large amount of bridge financing, or it can be held as cash in the company. If it's taken out of the firm, you can completely ignore it. It comes in and it goes out of the other window. So it doesn't change anything in your valuation. If it's used to pay down debt, it's going to change your debt ratio and your cost of capital. And if it's kept as cash, it's going to increase your cash balance, creating that jump in value on the, on the opening day. And this is sometimes called pre-money, post-money. I don't know whether you even want to use that language. Post-IPO, you get that extra money coming in. to so DCF value plus that extra cash. Now, in the case of Twitter, they actually were very explicit. So that's in response. So this was right in the prospect. As they said, they were going to raise about a billion dollars in the offering. And they said they were planning to keep it as the company because they might need the cash for their reinvestment. So in my valuation, I'm going to keep the billion dollars. But if they told me that somebody was cashing out, I don't know who the VCs in Twitter were. Maybe you know, one, of, one of those VCs said, we want to just take our money out. Then how do we ignore the billion dollars? So don't automatically add the proceeds to your cash balance. Check the, the prospectus first to make sure. The claims from prior equity investors do what we do in traditional valuation. To the extent that there are options out there and rights and special deals, clean up for all of that because that's going to come out of your own. And in the money, out of the money. And one of the nice things about an IPO again is all these multiple classes of shares will get consolidated and converted to common stock. When Facebook went public, there were seven classes of shares because every VC round had created its own class. The day of the offering, all of those got converted into common shares. So it makes your life easier. But getting a share count at a, in an in a IPO is really messy, right? The prospectors will be all over the place. They count some. Don't take the number that they give you as gospel because then they will say, right below that, they will say, but we have ex excluded the following. And they will list out restricted stock, 
So your job is to take things that they've excluded and bring it back into the game because it is going to affect your value of equity as a company. So if existing investors have special claims, value them, take them out of your value because they are going to come up with those special claims. If we see that special options to buy extra shares, those would reduce your value of equity as a company. So the Twitter at seven class of convertible preferred stock, uh, 86 million restricted stock, 44.16 million options. All of this came right out of the prospectus. The 44.16 million options, I'm gonna value as options. So basically I do with what I do with traditional companies, all of the other shares, including non-vested restricted shares, I count as shares outstanding. I know some bankers can't only vested shares. I think that's bad practice is count all of the shares outstanding because somebody has a large block of non-vested shares. I can almost guarantee they're going to hang around to get them vested. So even though it looks non-vested for the moment, they're going to end up being vested. So that's the, the and finally, as the investment banking guarantee, the way it shows up is it'll show up as a discount on whatever your value is. A discount because you've guaranteed the price. Okay. Now, in return for so the investment banking, what, what are the services investment bankers offer? Ideas? Let's go down the list. Yes. Underwriting. So once a guarantee, the pricing guarantee, what else? Book run. Book run, in which case they offer a seller. So book runner basically means you know they they're getting on the phone or whatever the equivalent is in the digital age. They're contacting portfolio managers. They're doing road shows. Essentially, so they're selling your shares. What else? Are they valuing your company? That used to be one of the lists. You know, we put a value on your company, and that was put as a service. They also, after the, after the offering, do they leave? No, they offer after market support, which means they will buy shares. Morgan Stanley, which was the you know, which was the which was the the the, the investment bank of Facebook, and the week after the offering of the price was collapsing, came in and bought shares. They'll do it only up to a certain amount. So the whole host of services bankers claim to offer in an IPO. But nice people, right? In return, though, what do you what do you leave the table? Six percent, seven percent, seven and a half percent. That's been the the set for the last century. But let's take a look at all of the things that bankers did for IPOs and asked, are they still valuable today? The selling part, right? This is a big deal in the old days. Why? Because nobody had heard about your company. Goldman Sachs would have to get on and tell people, you know, this is what the company does. I would wager more people had heard about Facebook than Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley at the time Facebook went public. So the higher the profile of companies, the less you need the bank, right? Because people know what you do. We know the pricing that bankers provide this valuation is a, is a joke. How do we know it? Because whatever number they come up with, it seems to double with the offering day. So they're that good about even pricing the company, you shouldn't be. So every one of the services as you go down, it turns out that they're less useful or not useful at all today. Which is one reason why Bill Gurley, one of the leading VCs on Silicon Valley, I had an argument with about Uber, as raised the question of why are we doing this? Why do we need bankers? What's your turn? Instead of going through banks and setting an offering price, a direct listing, which is like an auction, right? Basically, that's, you know, so basically what you do is you bypass the process. You don't set a price. You let the demand and supply set the price in the opening day. There's no discount offer. You're leaving no money on the table. But it does come with the catch. Please, right now, if you make a direct listing, you're not allowed as a company to keep the cash. That's why Spotify had to return the cash with the direct listing, but that's fixable. Right? And direct listings are not going to work for everyone. If you're a company that nobody's heard about, you can try direct listing, but people might not demand. So there are still companies where I think the old, the old services matter, but I think it's good to open it up. And of course, there's a third alternative, right? Facts, which is a completely you look about it, completely inefficient. In this fact, what do you do? You trust Chamath Palapathy. I could find you, no, or, 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 you're picking him because you have what, 11 SPACs at one point in time. You pick a high profile investor who you think knows more about technology than you do. You assume he will find, so he doesn't even tell you what company he's going to buy. You're just giving it to him and trust saying, I, I think you can find a company with this 3 billion. 
And he says, trust me, I'll find the right company, I'll negotiate the right price, I'll get you a great deal. And in return for this, what does he get? The typical spec, 20% of your money. I remember looking at the 20% and said, there's nobody who's smart enough and special enough to make up that 20%. This isn't going to stand well. And of course, while it did really well in 2020 and 2021, it's completely fallen apart because many of these facts basically have nothing behind them. So you really have three ways of going public. One is the old fashioned, hire a banker, set an offering price with all of its limits. You've got direct listings where you've got institutional constraints that might get in the way. And if you're a low profile company, it's still a problem. Third is, we're, it's a work in progress. I don't think we've arrived at the final conclusion, but you're seeing all three processes now. And finally, yeah, go ahead. What do you mean you said it's an SEC, SEC requirements and direct listing. The SEC wants to protect you from yourself. They view direct listings as having a potential. They actually think bankers are good screeners of scams. So basically you won't get, they're worried that companies will go directly to the market, fool investors. So they've had set up all the structure of supposed protection for the investment. They, may, they want to make, they, historically, they've not encouraged direct listing. They didn't want companies to directly list because they felt it might lead to scams. So those institutional constraints remain. Remember, one of the choices you have with the offer proceeds is to keep it as a cash balance, which is one reason companies go public if they want to raise cash for CapEx. If I don't let you do that, then it's a big, it's a potential disadvantage. And that's a problem right now with direct listing because you cannot use it has to be cashed out by owners. So you have to do what Spotify did, let owners kind of cash. So as, uh, finally, in, in terms of pricing, we already, I already talked about how I price Twitter. I looked at the number of users. I multiplied by $100 per user. So it's a pricing process, but you can see that IPOs are all pricing all the time. I don't, know, I don't even know why IPO bankers even bother with discounted cash flow valuations because it's a pricing game. Now, if you look, actually look at what happens on the offering day in an IPO, on average, the price jumps about 15 to 20%. Some it doubles, some it triples, you know, but on average, jumps up 15%. This sounds like a great way to make money, right? So tell me as a greedy investor, how you take advantage of it. Sell the shares. First, you got to buy the shares, right? So first, you got to get in on the offering day. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the next 100 IPOs. I'm going to ask for 1,000 shares in every one of them. This should be a surefire way of making money, right? People have tried it, and it hasn't worked. So tell me what, what goes wrong when I set up a strategy of saying, look, I'm going to buy every IPO that comes, in, comes into the market, and I'm going to ask for 1,000 shares. What, what's going to go wrong? Bankers will restrict you. Like they won't, they don't want. But, but you make it sound like bankers have a conspiracy against you. But think about this process, right? There's demand and supply for the shares. In those companies where bankers have underpriced the shares, there will be too many people asking for shares. So the thousand shares you ask for, you might get 200 or 150, even if it's a fair process, because there are five times as many people asking for shares as their shares outstanding. Everybody gets only one fifth. So you get 200 shares in the most overpriced, in the most underpriced company. The companies that are overpriced, how many of the shares are you, that you ask for will you get? You'll get a thousand, they call you. Do, will you. do you want more? I can give you another thousand. Never take the extra thousand if you get that call because the fact that you get that call should terrify you. So you see what's going to happen? Your end portfolio is going to be overweighted in your overpriced stock and underweighted in your underpriced stocks. That's why mutual funds. In fact, I remember these first studies came out in the market People said, you know, well, we can make money on this. Some, and I know a couple of people started mutual funds to invest just in IPOs. When you look at their actual returns, so not seeing any of this excess return there. And it's because of the process. One other question. I said that there's a, this discount of 15% on average. That's money out of the pocket of the founders, right? And the VCs. That sounds like money you don't want to leave on the table. Historically, companies seem to have been okay with that. Why? 
First, if you look at how what percentage of the shares are offered on the offering day, it's not 100%. If it's 100%, that's a lot of money in the table. But if you're offering 6 or 8 or 9%, the way you think about that 15% jump in the price, it's great PR. right? Because what do you see in the Wall Street Journal the next day? XYZ company jumps on IPO. What do you hope will happen? Other people read the story. What do they do? They got to do They buy. The momentum feeds itself, and you hope the momentum will carry you forward. So historically, the reason founders and VCs have been okay with the discounting is they view it as kind of a, you know, sales leaders in retail stores, we basically come in, they're selling stuff at below cost. They think, oh, they will sell below our price because we make it up later because we are actually not planning. To, we can't even sell our shares for six months or a year. We need the prices to keep going up. So if you, you know the original studies for IPO is called it the IPO puzzle. This is a, how do founders accept it? But that was built on the premise that 100% of the shares were offered when in fact only five or 10 percent. Incidentally, that percentage that companies are offering on the on that first day of trading has dropped over time. In the 1980s, it was 40 to 50 percent. Now it's less than 10 percent. So it's almost like they're doing the sampling of the shares rather than all of the shares. So the alternatives have started to spring up. I think the old time banking led IPO is not long for this world. It's just too inefficient and there's nothing I'm getting in return. There's not enough service I'm getting in return. Could direct listings do it? Not unless you change the regulatory framework to allow direct listings to become more common. Could SPACs do it? Maybe if I pay 3%. Right? Bill Ackman had his back as well, where he lowered the 20% to 6% because he said 20% people are not, you know, that's a lot of money to leave on the table. So maybe there's a version of a SPAC that I can accept where I might say three to 4% for somebody I can trust, like a hedge fund. Think of it just as a variant of a hedge fund, saying that these guys can now use my money to go buy, you know, get involved in doing, you know, getting into companies on the ground floor. So whatever it is, that's the, 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 the it, there is change coming. So when we start the next class, we're going to start on packet, you know, the last couple of pages is the packet three. Packet three is real options. So if you get a chance, print off at least the first, I think it's 139 page, not as long as the last two packets. So download that packet, bring it with you for Monday's lunch. Uh, I wanted to ask you about um, the reinvestment. Uh, in one of the companies that somebody pitched in the micro price fund, it really caught my attention that they had negative working capital. They had huge things. I don't remember. It might have been Procter & Gamble, one of these. I have good terms for uh, not paying their suppliers. Yes. So when the company grows... Uh, working yeah. capital works in favor of them. Yeah. Um, maybe yeah. even uh, depending on how well or how bad your model capex, uh, your reinvestment might even be negative reinvestment in some of the models. Is that reasonable? You're the problem. Otherwise, you're using supply credit to speak out. That's basically what this is. And, uh, so your suppliers is, is funding you? With no interest, right? That's what yeah. makes it uh, yeah. go up. Is yeah. that the so the question is, is there really no Because the only reason this is showing up as far as we can happen is because we've forgotten in implicit interest rate on the right, which is the discount loss for the chose to get so in effect, it might look like you're pumping up your cash flows, but in reality, your operating income is lower because you paid more for the expenses. But that would be reflected in the mar so margins, the also historical. Margins. So you'll have lower margins, and this, but I'm saying these are two companies, one without this, oh, uh -huh. one with this, the company without this will have higher margins. It might end up, it might end up looking like, like the reinvestment is negative one and positive in the other, but the bottom line is the free cash of the firm might be much more similar than you realize. So I definitely wouldn't, I, I definitely shouldn't think about margins converging to other competitors. Because you are adopting this risk, and there's a risk to it, right? Because as you use supply of credit, and even though it might not show up in your traditional ratings, 
Okay. Ratings agencies do look at how much supply of credit you have mm -hmm. on your balance sheet. In good times, they might overlook it, but in bad, in bad times, often that's one of the red flags. There's a lot of supply of credit. And what if you don't, you're not able to make those things? So your rating that you compute for the company based on a synthetic rating is much more questionable with the company which uses supply of credit than the company that does not. So in other words, your true cost of debt might be might higher, be higher. Than the number because you're missing the fact that people lending to the company will actually be looking to supply credit as well and saying, hey, this, this company's got to pay all this credit. Now I'm lined up to get money from them. I'm going to charge a higher interest rate. And there's a final component, which is as companies scale up, often companies when they're sm smaller are able to use the supply of credit. You know, Amazon had started at, I think, non cash working capital at minus 20% of revenue. They were a huge user of supply of credit. But the way this would happen is they buy books from publishers they were as a book, as an online book retailer. But they only but pay when they, they sell. Exactly. They No, they collected the cash. But they're three months from, oh, so they didn't okay. have to yeah. pay the publisher. For they have negative uh, operating cycle. As a small company, this was a huge item. As Amazon scaled up, that minus 20% went to minus 18, minus 15, huh. minus 7, minus 3, and now it's close to 0%. Because at the, at the scaling that they're at now, it doesn't work. You can't scale up. So if you're doing non-cash working capital as a person with revenue, it better get smaller over time. And perhaps in terms of value, you start to disappear because you can't just build in this everlasting stream. Of oh, property. so it, 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 I can't perpetuate it's such a scenario. It's a, and even if it does, it's coming at the expense of, there has to be other reinvestment because it, all I did was let working capital get more and more negative. I'm not putting in any traditional net capex. My investment capital is going to hit zero and keep going right yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah, your balance sheet will not balance that's the yeah. bottom line right yeah. so if you think about hey your current libraries keep keep expanding my current assets say and i'm not investing in fixed assets if i keep projecting your balance sheet out at some point in time and very quickly my balance sheet is going to start to blow up so mm -hmm. evaluation where there's non-cash working capital there's very little net cap back and the non-cash working capital is a negative number that gets more negative over time is a valuation that's built on balance sheets that don't balance. And ROIC will it's, go to the moon. go to, to a high number and then it'll become negative. Because yeah, investment capital yeah. actually goes, you know. Right. So you're building a company that internally is just waiting to go up. Hmm. I'll tell you when you might get away with it. If you have a lot of traditional net capex and you have a non-cash working capital that's negative and it's a small person of revenue it's because of your business model. You, know, you might be a kind of business where people, you know, you get paid up front, but you don't pay the people who supply you to later. It's possible you've reduced your investment needs a little bit by using supply of credit to kind of, you know, but it's it's you still have a positive reinvestment, mm. right? Because of those other items. If you don't have that net capex, so all you have is negative working capital getting more negative over time. Uh, in in practice, that. what's going to blow the company up, if this is the reality, is that you're going to have to pay at some point and uh, in a moment of turmoil, it might not have cash. Yeah, but I think also you'll have accounting. Say, what auditor is going to sign off on your balance sheet, which doesn't balance? Mm -hmm. Something's happening yeah, right? something's that you're happening. missing, right? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you're going to end up with, 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 with the balance sheet, which on the liability side is this huge current liabilities item. What's on the asset side to, mm -hmm. to offset it? Retained earnings. No, that's a liability side as well. Oh, okay. So like, it's a computed number. So okay, you want to know assets. Ah, you yeah. told me not, no net capex, so the fixed assets are not growing. So what that's are you nice. adding on the asset side that keeps the balance sheet balanced? Cash. City on cash. Really profitable. So you're... Or, but then you take the supply credit and putting in cash. Well, flow. you would have positive uh, free cash flow and then you would sit it as cash, I guess. To... But then you can't discount the free cash flow. Yeah, can't discount. You'd have to leave it at zero because the only way- Because you're not distributing. Cash. So yeah. you can't do a discounted cash flow model because in a discounted cash flow model- You're no distributing, yeah, you're distributing. distributing. So yeah. Somewhere or the other, the model is breaking down. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So- Makes sense. That's the question I would have. And you have no net cap base, you have a big negative working capital that stays big and negative and gets more negative over time. Mm -hmm. How's the balance sheet balance? Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. That's the
They were sort of pre written in the water. No, no, that's why they the money moves and they'll be more like the children. And that was nothing, nothing like in the short term. So we use revenue for it, so the two are revenue for it, so that should be that for the money. And use that instead of the money. You just need either proxy for the And I was going to try another multiple one EV over resource size. Very good. I can just get the same thing as what EV has been. As a, um, as a lecturer, you mentioned that uh, there is an opportunity. I just still don't get why there exists such a scenario that saves uh, money on the table. Such a scenario that why the bank is willing to offer them under the price. Bank is under price because they've given the guarantee. It means that they deliver on the guarantee, you are the price. So it's frozen. So it's easy to understand why banks are still up to this. They discard because it makes their life easier. If you guarantee the price and you really guarantee a price, it's easier to guarantee a lower price than a higher price. They're just going to be able to deliver the guarantee. So, as we conclude, that the, the only reason we need a bank to be an engineer person is they can guarantee the sales. They can guarantee that's, the that's the only reason when you're paying a lot for nothing, right? Mm -hmm. if, you set, if you allow the bank to set a price lower, than, it's like having the real estate guarantee the price, but yeah. as you mentioned, the price. Yeah. The way they guarantee the price is they take whatever price they have, oh. and knocks out twenty percent. That guarantee the price. Pay me a commission for the guarantee price. You're going to say, no, of course not. I'm, no, anybody can sell my house at twenty percent below the market price. So to me, this is the least of the services banks are providing. This is not what you're paying. You're paying the bank for the selling services, for the support services, for the help they give you on the prospect of giving you recognition if you're a small company. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's, that's true. what you pay for, not paying for the guarantee. Oh, I see. The guarantee is very, doesn't have much value because I let you set the price in there. Yeah, 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 right. 